Hello, and hello to anyone who has joined us today for the research ethics webinar. We're going to wait another minute for people to enter the Zoom room. In the meantime, I think I'll make some introductions. I'm Adrian Klein. I'm the Research Integrity Officer for the Graduate Center. And uh, every campus has a Research Integrity Officer. Um, listening in today, potentially, uh, and available to answer your questions, are a few campus Rios. Um, Diane Simmons from the Borough of Manhattan Community College, Faculty of English. Uh, Kristen Sommer, I see, is with us who is from the psychology faculty of the Graduate Center and Baruch College. Uh, I think we'll be joined by Rosemary Wesson, who is the research integrity officer at City College and a member of the faculty of chemical engineering and associate dean of research. Um, Linda Mules is with us today. She's the university executive director of research integrity and compliance. Um, from her staff, Linda Peralta, Senior Research Compliance Administrator may be joining us, as well as Angela Pila, who is the Export Control Officer. And we'll be hearing today from David Hirschnow, who's the Director of the Graduate Center's Writing Center, and most importantly, from our main presenter, who is Fanny Enever, from, who is the University Research Compliance Officer in the Office of Research at CUNY Central. Now, again, thanks for joining us today. Um, a little housekeeping, confirming your attendance. If you view this entire presentation, um, you'll get an email confirming your attendance, which I will also send to your program APO, your assistant program officer. Your APO will record that you have met this requirement. It may be several days, perhaps even a week before you receive this email confirming your attendance. Please be patient. Questions. Now, the presentation today will outline good ethical practices. If you have questions for the presenters, please type them into the Q&A. We have a, this panel I've just mentioned of capable people who will try to answer your questions. If you wish to submit your thoughts and observations with the other attendees, you can use the chat function. Now, I uh, can see that quite a number of people have come into the Zoom room, so I think we'll begin our presentation I want to again welcome you and remind you that you will get an email confirming your attendance if you view this entire webinar. And uh, to remind you that you are the future of the research in your fields. You can perform and model good research practices. So this training is to remind you of those good research practices. Thanks, and now I'll turn it over to Fanny Enever. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for attending. This is an uh, important topic. So just some more housekeeping. Um, the Throughout the slides, there are going to be a big blue question mark, and that signals that it's time for audience input using the chat. This is called a chat waterfall. Um, and also, just as a reminder, although you got on your screen, that this is uh, being recorded. So, and the, as uh, Adrian said, use the Q and A for questions. The chat is just going to um, go throughout your screen. So, we'll start with the first question, which is, what does research ethics mean to you? So, are people seeing the? I think. So Adrian, do we have it set up so that um, the attendees can put things in the chat? Well, this isn't much of a waterfall. Um, so uh, we, um, uh, perhaps Adrian, you can check with uh, the technical people to see that we've enabled the chat. Um, I see that people are putting things in Q&A and, okay, this is, yes, Tiffany says the chat is disabled, the chat is disabled, the chat is disabled. Um, so we'll try to work on that. So I will I, try to work on that. Thank you. Sorry. Q&A is available to people though. 
Um, so the uh, we, we wanted to separate them just because we wanted a lot of people to respond to these prompts and then weeding out the actual questions that we want to answer um, would make it harder with um, 240 chats. So um, if you, okay, so at least you've thought about um, and attempted to use a chat, which is um, what research ethics means to you and um, one of the things that I was struck with this morning as I was reading Paul Krugman's article, it was about crime and not that violating research ethics is a crime, it can be, but he talked about the social connections that keep most of us being law-abiding. And I thought that was a great quote, and it does apply here because really science is a social activity, even if sometimes it's somewhat solitary, but you're still connected to the whole community of all the human beings who do research. And it's really those social connections that help us be law abiding. So the learning objectives for this webinar are First, to recognize how to avoid plagiarism and inappropriate authorship. Second, understand how to maintain honesty and compliance. And we'll talk about the difference between those. Be familiar with solutions to support the responsible conduct of research. And then know where to find help. So that's the outline. Um, and so we'll just jump right in to the um, training requirements, or a little introductory. The um, probably all of you have completed your city training. Um, it's required of really anybody at CUNY who does research and it's good for four years. And then there's a, this webinar is required for all graduate center students in the bench sciences and clinical science and recommended for all others. And it's also required for all postdocs by CUNY policy. So research, perhaps it was second grade, third grade, fourth grade, where you learned about the scientific process. And it's very straightforward. You identify there's a gap in knowledge that uh, you want to um, try to fill, you plan your approach, you gather data, and then you analyze the data. Um, very nice, very straightforward. This is more like what the reality is. And this actually is probably is um, one of the better research experiences you might have because at least you didn't double back or fall into a huge pothole. But it is bumpy. And because it's bumpy, it's really tempting to take shortcuts. Just go from one high point to the other. But it's always important to be honest and to follow through, even if it means, even just for a matter of dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. It's essential to the research process that you follow it and you don't take shortcuts. So the expectations for research to be ethical is um, there are things that are good practice, the social connections that Paul Gorgon was mentioning, international and national norms and standards, institutional codes of conduct, and expectations of re relevant research disciplines. So the research discipline that you're in is a community and there are certain expectations that may be different um, in other uh, types of research. But it's very important that you understand the norms in your particular area. And then there are federal regulations and state and local laws. There are institutional policies and procedures. And then there are sponsor requirements um, if your research is getting externally funded. And there's a link here of these slides will be made available, by the way. So this is, there's the Singapore statement on research integrity that uh, goes into a lot more detail on just the sort of philosophical underlying 
the ethical research expectations. So we're now going to the first learning objective, which is avoiding plagiarism and inappropriate authorship. It looks as if the chat might be enabled. So let's see if we can get a waterfall on this one. What's wrong with plagiarism? Okay, we're getting some really, really good chats here. I, th I, I like this tempo. I can kind of read them. Um, it's disingenuous. It's theft. Uh, actually, the word plagiarism comes from the Greek word for kidnapping. So it is theft. It's, it's dishonesty. It's stealing other people's work. Um, bad science. Researcher not progress, taking someone else's words. So these are these are. Um, I'm very happy with this, the chat that we're getting, um, and you can keep chatting and uh, viewing it as um, we go through this topic. Um, the so it it seems like there's pretty much a consensus that it's not good to plagiarize. So how not to plagiarize? You need to be clear on what ideas, processes, results, and words are original. And in it's the proper use of citations, which is can be a little bit tricky because if there's no citation, that means it's yours. It's not as if you get to cite this paper or this book as what's original, you the absence of citation is what's making that claim. And what makes it a little quick, tricky is that that's also true if it's general knowledge. And so this is something where the um, it, having guidance from someone else and probably also very importantly, look just looking at other papers in your field and see what kind of, you know, if you say the sky is blue, you um, typically don't have to cite that unless you want to say um, you're talking about being on Mars, in which case the sky would be red, we think. Um, and again, you only omit a citation if it's your work or it's common knowledge and always provide a citation when quoting, paraphrasing, or summarizing and make sure that if it is a quote, it's in quote marks. And Typically in papers, um, it's you would summarize rather than quote because the idea is that you're synthesizing a lot of information or pointing out what's most pertinent in this previous work. Um, but of course, quoting is fine as long as you put it in quote marks. So, um, then related to plagiarism is authorship. So when should somebody be listed as an author? If they contributed, when they contributed significant contribution, substantial contribution, if they wrote it, uh, meaningfully contributed, meaningful confrontation, original ideas. So contributed effort. Okay, so these are these are um, pretty straightforward concepts to um, to articulate. It just can get a little tricky when the rubber meets the road and you're trying to decide should someone be an author. So again, there. Are, standards in the field and also standards that journals have imposed. And so the um, there's points one, two, and three. And the idea is that this is and um, the, the substantially contributing to or significantly actually contributing, excuse me, the conception and design of the project, and these are or. 
So somebody can just contribute to the conception design and be an author, uh, just contribute to the acquisition of data, and, excuse me, just the analysis and interpretation of data, but then they also have to write it. And that's kind of the layman's understanding of the word author is you wrote it or helped write it. And also approving the final publication that this, by saying you're an author, you say you approve it. Now there are situations where you're part of it is the only part that you can really approve and you can't necessarily take full responsibility for what somebody else did on another part, but at least uh, proving that what's written about your contribution is correct. And we don't want to have ghost authorships. Ghost authorships is where somebody else writes it. Um, there, In the past, there were uh, sort of egregious examples of this where a drug company would write an article and then shop it around to find some doctor to put their name on it. This actually was part of the um, thalidomide uh, scandal, if you have read about that, where there was one woman at FDA who basically prevented thalidomide from being marketed in the U.S. Um, so if so, no ghost authorship means if someone really did qualify as an author, they should be listed. And then also no gift authorships. So by itself does not qualify someone to be an author if they got the funding, if they all they did was collect the data and not help write or approve it, providing contracted services or overall supervision of the research group without appreciable input into the individual project. And you know this is really uh, treading on very sensitive territory, but um, that when when the head of a research group gets to have their name on it is something again you have to look at the norms in um, in your particular field. And the Office of Research Integrity, which is a federal office that uh, deals with research integrity, um, has this guidance that specifically for faculty student collaborations. And the first one is sort of reiterating what we just said was individuals have made a substantive contribution to a project merit authorship. And then this is a warning for mentors that they may must exercise great care to neither award authorships to students whose contributions do not merit it, nor to deny authorship and due credit to the work of students. And this can be something that um, can cause a lot of friction. And one of the uh, recommendation that's easy to make, but possibly hard to carry out is that it's beneficial to discuss authorship early in a project. And um, if you can bring yourself to do it, um, say, you know, I'm going to be doing X, Y, and Z in this project. Do you think that I will be a author on the publication? Um, and then this last two slides, why should you avoid self-plagiarism? which is also known as duplicate overlapping or redundant publication. Also known as salami slicing. Why shouldn't you avoid that? Shouldn't you just get as many publications as you can? I guess I've stumped you. I don't see a single answer. Clouds of research record, depending. Okay, thank you. Lacks integrity, conflate. It's lazy, reduces the value of the work. Okay, not original, can't have publications. Right, okay. So um, thank you for responding. Um, could violate copyright laws and actually uh, this is something where many journals have, um, even to the point where they ask you to, when you submit a paper, to submit all the other um, papers that have already been published 
on the same topic. Um, so submit to only one journal at a time. That is the expectation of almost all journals. Uh, it seems inefficient, right? You submit it and then you get the peer review and three months later, they're like, uh, no, and then you have to start over. Um, make sure to cite previous work um, so that it um, it's clear that what's new in the new publication. And then again, avoid salami slicing. So I'm going to pause here. And David wanted to say a few things. Um, Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Hershino. I'm the director of the Writing Center. Um, and I just wanted to comment uh, very quickly on, on one other aspect of plagiarism to be mindful of um, that I, in my experience, is an area where it's easiest for people to um, really not quite realize that what they're doing is plagiarism or just kind of not be aware. So not um, intentional plagiarism, but but unintentional plagiarism. And it, it comes, uh, I think it happens uh, often when it comes to conceptual frameworks, um, broad theories, ways of understanding um, that are being used as a kind of general interpretive lens for uh, making sense of your objective analysis. Um, so a couple things, when it comes to people in the humanities or in more humanities, humanities adjacent uh, social science disciplines, I think the biggest issue often is, well, this is uh, that these are, you know, when you're in these disciplines, you're probably more familiar with the need to cite a conceptual framework as a guiding lens for thinking. Um, but it can still be tricky at times to see the need in part because often uh, when it comes to a conceptual framework, you're using it because you really, really agree with it. It just makes sense. It's how you see the world. Um, and so it's easier to sort of uh, feel like it's what you think too, um, and that it's not um, something, you know, that sort of you see the separation between your thinking and the work of, of people that, that came before you. Um, so if you're, you know, using anything as a guiding premise or a way to think, if you're aware of anyone who can, you know, should be getting credit for articulating that, um, think about how you can extend that credit to them. Now, if you're in the sciences or in more um, quantitative social sciences, um, this is where, you know, there are times where you may be having a, a um, be influenced by a broader conceptual framework, um, and it's just less common in the for for you to be thinking about that as something to cite, right? Like people in the sciences um, and quantitative social sciences are well aware of the need to cite um, uh, findings and results from previous studies and unique or novel methodologies. But sort of guiding conceptual frameworks sort of falls outside of those two areas. Um, and, and I think that often it's really an issue of just thinking about how to articulate um, your indebtedness, right? So think about action verbs that are essentially about taking and using as a lens. So I draw on so-and-so's concept of X to see things in, in Y way. I deploy so-and-so's theory, I am indebted to so-and-so's theory, and then you say how or in what way. Um, so these are ways to acknowledge verbally or like in your writing um, that you are making use of a way of seeing that someone else has kind of offered and made available to us. Um, and, you know, uh, it's always the worry that people have articulated these ideas before you. Um, and you're just not aware. Um, I would just say as a final comment, this is really about um, working in good faith. So just kind of think about whether you are, you know, are having ways of thinking because you were exposed to the, those being articulated by other people. And if you're aware of that, then, then try to extend some credit. Thank may you. I, may I add a word here as well? Thank you, David. Sure. Okay, a question has come in from a student. If I'm using my own ideas from my previous article, why is it plagiarism if I'm still working on the same line of my initial work? 
Now, self-plagiarism raises questions for students, especially in their methodology section. When they think they cannot improve on the way that they have described how they're going about their work. Can anyone on the panel uh, respond to that? Hmm. Well, if you put in a citation, it's not plagiarism. If you cite yourself right. from your previous publication, then right. you're clear. Right. right. Thank you. And, 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 you know, the, the, the presumption is if you cite yourself, there's two, two reasons, you, you know, if the first time you articulated a point came previously, you cite yourself and, you know, you may benefit from people following that to read your previous work. Um, but I just would flag when you cite yourself, you are, a, you, you, you need to make sure not to use word for word, the same that you had before, right. That like you're citing the idea that you pr presented before, um, but that doesn't, just citing yourself doesn't give you permission to word for word copy and paste what you had. You kind of have to, to rework and rearticulate um, your sentences. And the questioner says, well, I said it perfectly the first time. <laughs> um, so that is, that is a bind um, that you have. I I think if you put it in quotes, and then cite, perhaps that is allowable under copyright. Yes, and, and also, you know, one of the real tasks in, in academic writing is to articulate things at different scales of expansion and um, succinctness or summary. Um, and when you have laid something out at length previously, um, often what you do later is you cite yourself and you you now kind of describe that point in a much more summarized way. The presumption being if people wanted to see it laid out at length, they go to the previous thing you wrote. And a lot of times um, that's something that you will get back from an editor if they, they might say, you know, summarize this or they might say, you know, so I think to a certain extent, it's um, up to an editor. And again, looking at the way research papers in your field have been written will give you some guidance as to what the norms are. So Thank you. I think that's all good guidance and we'll probably move on from this. Okay. So the next uh, section is um, honesty and compliance. So honesty is you avoid fabrication, falsification, conflicts of interest, uh, inaccurate financial accounting, and then comply with specific rules that um, may uh, apply to a subset of types of research, protection of human subjects, animal welfare, biosafety, and international research security. So we're going to start with another question, and I've been told that you all can't see each other's chat, which was not the setting we requested. However, um, if you could answer this. You just have to change everyone. I think the default, so there's a drop down menu. It says just send to hosts and panelists, but you need to change that to everyone. And then your chat will be sent to everyone. Ah. Oh, so it's them, not us. <laughs> um, okay. So why would someone be tempted to make up research data? Have a deadline pressure to publish, to save time, laziness, financial incentives, publish or perish, deadline and procrastination, um, makes life easier, um, wanting a specific outcome. They were tired. I don't think graduate students ever get tired. Um, so these are all great answers. And um, I think this it shows a great deal of empathy on your part, um, not to say um, because they're horrible human beings. So you may be tempted. It sounds like some of you may even have been tempted, but 
this is the very heart of research is the honesty that they're not alternative facts and there's no fabrication, which is uh, typically it's making up uh, data material or results. Sometimes people inadvertently do it. They're um, particularly um, in a grant application. Um, you said, okay, this is going to be the table of preliminary results. Uh, you, you know, make something up and then you forget and the pressure of the deadline, uh, the pressure to get funding, um, you forget to take out those placeholders. There have been instances where that uh, people were caught with unintentional fabrication, but it is all the pressures that um, you were all so eloquently describing um, that uh, make someone actually uh, do this fabrication. Why would someone be tempted to change their data? Same reasons, um, a lot of the same overlap with fabrication or falsification, um, but to strengthen, to not support hypothesis, you don't want a null result. Um, and so th you throw out the outliers, um, you don't want to disappoint anybody. Ego, yes, I mean, it's a beautiful hypothesis. If it wasn't so beautiful, it wouldn't be yours. So uh, this is called falsification. So you manipulate research materials or processes. So it's not, it's not just making it up from whole cloth like fabrication, but falsification um, are changing and emitting data or results such that the research record does not accurately represent the research. And so this is, a uh, there's some gray areas in here because of course sometimes you have to manipulate um, anybody who does image based research you have to manipulate the images but there's certain ways in your discipline that these are the acceptable ways you know you might increase the contrast you don't photoshop it to move the bands so um, that's why it's not just any manipulation, it's manipulation such that the research record does not accurately represent the research. And examples of falsification are manipulating images appropriately, and this is um, very common in the ones that are federally funded and reported to the Office of Research Integrity. Changing methods without documenting dropping outliers without documentation or altering the raw data. And there are examples of things that are not considered falsification under the federal regulations, but they um, are called questionable research practices, but misleading statistical analyses of reporting. This is sometimes called a p-hacking. So if you're in a field where you said the statistical analysis is a difference between something being a null hypothesis or supporting the hypothesis, there are certain ways of manipulating the data that um, you can make something look significant when it's really not justified. And again, um, journals have started looking at that and looking at ways to prevent that. Um, some of the things are um, in uh, clinical trials, for example, there are requirements for pre-registering. So you have to say ahead of time what your hypothesis is, not just collect 20 variables and see which one has a P less than 0.05. Um, but even if you're not going to get caught, you should not be doing either um, falsification or questionable research practices because other people are going to be relying on you. You are contributing to the body of knowledge and it should be true knowledge. And CUNY, like all universities that receive federal funding, has a process for addressing allegations of research misconduct, which specifically refers only to plagiarism, fabrication, and falsification. And it applies to results presented in grant applications as well as publications. 
So certain things are not, it, um, are handled in a different way. This is a very uh, cut and dried and almost legalistic approach. Authorship disputes are not considered research misconduct and p hacking is not considered research misconduct for two examples. So in order to find that there was research misconduct, there had to be a significant departure from the accepted practices of the relevant research community. The conduct was committed intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, so not an honest error. Um, and a preponderance of the evidence proves misconduct occurred. So it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. Preponderance of the evidence is more like a misdemeanor where it's more likely than not that it occurred. And um, just some resources. There's the CUNY Responsible Conduct of Research website. There's the policy regarding the disposition of allegation of research misconduct, the policy on training and responsible conduct of research, and then the college research integrity officers. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, every college has a research integrity officer, and the website has this list. And again, you're going to be getting these slides, so um, you actually will have links that you can follow. And why should you avoid research misconduct? Not just because it's the right thing to do when you're conforming with the norms of your peers, but I, the results can be corrections or retractions of publications. You can receive a letter of reprimand, suspension or termination of funding, being debarred from receiving grants, either for a period of time or forever, disciplinary action by CUNY, and stigma and damage to your reputation. So um, these are pretty egregious um, consequences that you really want to avoid. Um, it does make me um, remember something that really should have been on the slides is that even though these are bad outcomes, CUNY actually expects that anyone who has knowledge of potential research misconduct should report it. it the reports can be made anonymously. Uh, anybody who reports it is protected from retaliation, but um, and it's certainly not something you would do lightly, but it is the expectation that this is something that you will do if you have any uh, reason to suspect research misconduct by anyone. It doesn't, not, not necessarily your mentor, not necessarily a fellow student, um, but uh, anything that comes to your attention, uh, it, we do expect that you will report it. Okay, so we're gonna, um, I guess, Adrian, were there any questions about research misconduct that we should address? You've done a great job of addressing all aspects of this. Somebody wanted a further description of salami slicing, but besides that, uh, I think you've handled every question asked. Okay, well, salami slicing is just the shorthand for um, you do an experiment and you report the results on women in one publication, you report the results on men in another publication, you report the results on children in another publication, where really what you should do is have one publication that reports all your results. That would That's an extreme example. But the idea is that um, you're plumping up the number on your resume and usually at the expense of the quality of the your publications. Can I, can I just jump in for one second? For some reason, I can't um, send a, a message out to everybody, uh, to all the attendees, but I just wanted to note with respect to misconduct and disciplinary action, um, at least in my field in psychology, research recent cases of um, research misconduct have, have, have resulted in termination of employment. So in, you know, more often than not, a, a university is going to dissociate um, themselves from you if it's been found that you have falsified or fabricated results. So it's, the consequences are quite severe. And, and a lot of people also get sued by their co-authors and former students because of the trickle down damage to their reputation and all the subsequently retracted papers and everything. It, it really is, um, it is, it has a lot of, um, widespread effects to anybody with whom um, that person has collaborated. But the main reason not to do it 
is because it's um, not how science is done. You have to be to be honest. So we're moving on to uh, avoiding conflicts of interest. So how can be a, a be objective if the research results could make you richer or poorer? May not apply to many people at the postdoc level. Um, probably the most common would be um, if you have a startup. Um, but any ideas about how to make yourself objective when there is perhaps a financial incentive? Okay, if you get fa caught falsifying, you're being in big trouble. Disclose them to disclose this. Uh, um, not worth it. It's strong enough. You should recuse yourself, right? So conflict of interest disclosure, right? So uh, the um, this is actually something that's mandated by CUNY that um, if you are listed on a funded research project, you have to submit a significant financial interest disclosure when the funding application is submitted, the annual progress report to the funder is submitted, and when the financial information changes. Um, and it, you actually, um, you have to submit the disclosure even if you have nothing to disclose. But having a financial interest is not like research misconduct, where it's an all or nothing. Um, they can be managed. And I see disclosure in a lot of answers. And that's absolutely the first thing that happens is you, you disclose it you, to um, the funder, to the um, research participants. If there are any, sometimes CUNY will think that you, there needs to be an appointment of an independent monitor to look at um, to, to look at expenditures to make sure there's no bias. Uh, restrictions on data analysis or having someone else look at the data analysis, again, to avoid bias. And then sometimes reduction or elimination of the financial interest, um, selling the stock, stop doing the consulting, et cetera. So again, the point that I want to make is that it's it's not an all or nothing. And if you have a financial interest, you're a bad person and you can't do research. It's just, it needs to be disclosed and it needs to be managed. Um, and disclosure um, is very commonly required by journal editors, conference organizers, and again, the IRB, if it's research with human subjects. And so this would actually apply even to situations where you're not getting a, uh, applying for a grant, um, especially with research with human subjects, that um, if there's a financial interest in unfunded research, you still would need to disclose it. And the whole idea is that the openness engenders trust in your results and also in the whole research enterprise. Hollywood likes this conflict of interest, um, people doing research, that, to falsifying research to make them rich. I don't think it happens nearly as often as Hollywood thinks it does. And just, um, these are some resources. Uh, the website has the conflict of interest policy, the requirements for public health services and non-public health service funded research. And if you're not sure which is which, or um, certainly the office can help you. The, the forms, um, something about the committee. And then uh, just like each college has a research integrity officer, each college has a conflict officer, and they are listed in the conflict of interest website. And I just actually realized I didn't update this slide. Um, we are moving towards a electronic rather than paper-based form submission, which um, hopefully will make things go a little smoother. Um, although you never know when you implement a new electronic system, whether it's actually going to do all the great things you think it is. And again, non-compliance with disclosure um, can be, uh, you can be required to take retraining. 
corrections or even perhaps retractions of publications, suspension or termination of funding, um, if the, especially if it's federally funded. Um, you could be disbarred from receiving grants if there was an undisclosed significant uh, conflict of interest, disciplinary action by CUNY. And then the worst is just lost in trust because it'll be a headline. And more people will look at it and say, oh, those scientists, they're just in it for the money. We can't trust them. And um, we're, uh, researchers have enough problem with trust that we do not want to, um, we don't want to contribute any more reasons for that. Okay, uh, moving on to um, the financial accounting. Why do you have to be careful with research money? It's your money, right? You got the grant. Isn't it your slush fund? Okay, transparency, be responsible not for personal gain. That's not really yours. You owe the funder embezzlement. It's allocated for something specific, right? Potential impact on future grant applications, not fair to the funding organization. Um, audits, responsibility, use it for the right purpose. Okay, all these, these um, very good answers. It came from uh, tax money, right. So these are just actually reiterating some of the stuff that has so um, nicely appeared in the chat. Um, the research grants are given for purposes in your approved budget. Uh, make sure you are familiar with all budget requirements. You have to carefully document all expenditures and efforts. And uh, this footnote sounds like uh, government bureaucraties, and it is. The charges must be accurate, allowable, and properly allocated. And the government has been worrying about misuse of tax dollars ever since it, uh, in the Civil War, it was paying people for blankets and that what showed up were rags. So the federal government has a lot of rules to make sure that when you get federal money, uh, you are clear about um, what it is spent on. Um, and a lot of uh, this help is available for the Research Foundation of City of New York. I've just put a couple of the links here. The whole Their whole website has a lot of good information how to prepare a budget, how to manage an award, how to procure goods and services, basically how to spend the money, and then effort reporting. A lot of times the, um, the, a lot of the funds go to um, supporting the personnel who are doing the research. And so it's important to that you, if you say it's going to be 15% of your time, that you actually document that you spent 15% of your time um, that you were paid for. Um, and again, non-compliance with the requirements required retraining, loss of research funds. They can pull the whole grant. Uh, CUNY would have to pay it back if, if, it's, um, if it's serious enough. Re a repayment, suspension or termination of the research because you don't have the funding. It can actually lead to crime, fines and criminal prosecution. Someone put in the chat embezzlement, um, uh, disciplinary action for CUNY, and again, a loss of trust. This is going to be a headline in the local newspapers. And they're like, yeah, you give these researchers money and they spend it on alcohol. And that's, you know, we can't trust. How can we trust someone who acts that way? So. As a researcher, you are really upholding the norms, not just for yourself, but for the whole research community. So uh, Adrian, any questions that have come in that we should address before we turn on to compliance? Uh, no, we, uh, I think you are up to speed on the questions that have been asked. Okay. And of course, I want to add something for all of those who are in the audience that you represent all different disciplines at the CUNYs. And as a consequence, some of this will seem more applicable to you than to others. 
but this will be information useful to you throughout your professional careers. You will have colleagues or you yourself might be confronted with these things. Not everything will seem to apply to you, but please bear with us because it's all useful to academics and researchers. Yes, thank you. And um, yeah, some of you may not be, your research may not involve protecting human subjects, animal welfare, biosafety, or international research security, but um, perhaps it's good to know um, as a citizen that uh, these uh, requirements are being imposed on other researchers. So why are there special requirements for research if it involves human subjects? Consent, ethical guidelines, violation of rights, ensure the welfare, ethical concerns, protect the vulnerable, reduce or prevent harm, safety, respect participants, avoid lawsuits. Lots of people have been hurt before, preventing exploitation. Okay, very good. And um, so you can th perhaps think of this not only as a researcher, but also um, as someone who might potentially be in a uh, subject in research in the future. So one of the big questions is, when do I have to submit to the IRB? And there are really sort of two ways to think about it. If someone's going to have a specific experience to help you produce generalizable knowledge. So a specific experience is they will do something different because of your research. So many people think if a survey is anonymous, it doesn't have to go through the IRB. That's not correct. Someone's doing something differently. You're treating them as a guinea pig. But it is to produce, it has to be research in that it's producing generalizable knowledge. So for example, in the federal regulations, oral history is not considered research because it's not generalizable. It's just focused on the person, the experience of the person that you're interviewing. So that does not have to go through the IRB or the research uses identifiable private information. So there's a lot of research that can be done without interacting with people, but if you're using their private identifiable data, then there have to be safeguards. And this is probably the most important slide for human subject research. When in doubt, don't guess, ask the HRPP coordinators at the college or uh, those of us in Central, we're very happy to have that discussion because there's a lot of nuance. We've had a lot of experience. We've all had a lot of experience with things do and do not require it. I do want to say, um, for those of you, you have to have the city training to do human subject research. And some people have gotten tripped up by the term exempt. Um, you can't do your own exempt determination. Getting Even if you read the definition and you're 100% convinced that your research is exempt, you still have to submit to the IRB. You still have to get consent from your subjects. You still have to protect their rights and welfare. Um, and you, you still have to wait until the IRB says, yes, it's exempt before you can start. And if it turns out you do have to submit to the IRB, these are some general principles to keep in mind. You want to minimize the risks. You want to ensure that privacy and confidentiality are protected. You want to either obtain consent or justify why you can't get consent. And consent means agreement. It doesn't necessarily mean a signature. And that you're going to protect vulnerable participants, such as children and prisoners. Uh, let's see. So there's a question, which office should we go to for the IRB? So that's going to be on the, on the next uh, slide right here. So the Human Research Protection Program, um, CUNY has a part in it, and the HRPP coordinators at each college have a part in it. Um, that's the last bullet uh, for each college. Um, and that we've got 
a link to the policies, procedures, and guidelines, and then a link to the electronic system, which um, we are trying to set up so that you can actually just start there and find out what it is you need to do. May, may I add that the person who directs Human Research Protection Program at the Graduate Center is Rebecca Banchik. Yep, she'd be on that list if I clicked the link. <laughs> yes, there you go. Um, okay, then again, non-compliance with the requirements, required retraining, not being able to use the data. Um, and that's not so much an IRB decision, but there are many journals that will say um, you can't publish this if you didn't have IRB approval to gather the data. Uh, suspension or termination of research, the IRB can stop it. Uh, notification to subjects, collaborators, supervisors, and our granting agencies if you were non-compliant. Disciplinary action by CUNY. And again, a loss of trust. Um, it There are a lot of little rules with human subject research and a little bit of a violation of rules is not going to make it to the press, but a uh, big one will. And that's just, you know, not a good look for research. Um, we're moving on to, are there special requirements of research if it involves animals? Why are there special requirements of research if it involves animals? Real guinea pigs, not human guinea pigs because they're living. They cannot consent. They cannot give humane care for the animals. Experience stress, respect for life. Uphold integrity in science, ethics. Ethical concerns apply to animals as well. Ethical concerns all through life. They're still living organisms, respect for life. Okay, so those are, um, this is, again, a pretty ethical, easy ethical, and I'm not going to um, say much about it because the requirements are um, very detailed and complex in terms of the requirements for animal welfare, training, um, procedures, the approval by the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, and this is college-based, so uh, many uh, any college that, where there is animal research has its own IACUC and its own, um, you would go to the individual college website. PETA will come for you and all life deserves respect, or pets will come for you and all life deserves respect. Yes, your, your spaniel will look at you with spaniel eyes and say, you didn't do the right thing. Um, and again, non-compliance, um, actually I should add, Peter will come for you on this, required read training, not being able to use the data, suspension or termination of research, notification to collaborators, supervisors and granting agencies, disciplinary action by CUNY, and um, loss of trust again. Uh, we're moving on to biosafety. And why does some research require additional biosafety oversight? I'm not sure if there's actually anybody on the call who does uh, protect the environment, risk of contamination, public health concerns, increased risk, safety is important. And I guess, you know, one of the things I can say about all of these compliance is that if you look at the history, the history was, hey, researchers are ethical professionals, they know how to regulate themselves, and then someone didn't, and then the rules got involved. So a lot of these rules for compliance are documenting that you're not as bad as the people in the past. So anyone involved in research that potentially be unsafe to humans or in the environment should be familiar with biosafety requirements. There's an environmental health safety and risk management website for laboratory safety, hazardous materials, health safety, radiation safety. And then um, there are some 
very specific ones. Again, I'm not sure if anyone in this call is involved with this, but there is a special committee that uh, has to uh, proactively approve research involving recombinant or synthetic RNA or DNA, transgenic animals, infectious agents, select agents and toxins, and dual use research of concern. And that um, th those have to do with things with potential military applications, the select agents and toxins and dual use research of concern. And this is not something that uh, a even a postdoc is supposed to know on their own. This is something that the mentors should make sure that um, uh, anyone working in their labs would be uh, very aware of the requirements and have the right training. Again, non-compliance required retraining, suspension or termination of research, notification to supervisors, federal, state, or city agencies, because this has to, as people correctly identified, this has to do with public health and granting agencies. These, you can have fines and criminal prosecution if the conduct was reckless, disciplinary by action by CUNY, and again, loss of trust. We do not want those articles in the paper that a whole bunch of trichloral ethylene was spread all over the streets of New York City. And then why are there special requirements for research if it involves international collaboration? Aren't we all one big happy family? <laughs> different norms in different parts of the world, difference in policies, international laws, national security. Uh, every country has its own policies, different policies based on countries, laws in different countries. So actually, um, yes, the laws of, in different countries are important, but these um, these rules really um, have to do with bad actors, um, international actors uh, trying to steal defense-related research. So obviously you bring benefits, the breadth of knowledge, perspective, and creativity, but anyone who's doing international research has to be aware of potential threats Inten you don't want to intentionally share materials or information with a potential military defense use, or you want to make sure you're doing it correctly if there's a military defense use. Internationally collaborating with sanctioned entities um, such as Cuba or North Korea, and then unintentionally allowing unauthorized access to um, some international uh, collaborators. You've seen this slide before. <laughs> um, when in doubt, don't guess, ask. And the um, each uh, college, this is going to be on a next uh, subsequent slide. Uh, each college has a um, expert control officer, and um, Angela Pilla in the central office is our resident expert. So. The aim of the research security is to prevent unintentionally allowing unauthorized access to proprietary information. And the data breaches can come from straight out cyber attacks, uh, harder to defend against is phishing or social engineering or insider access. Uh, someone that you trusted with access actually is sharing internationally against policy. And then uh, what happens to you during foreign travel that, uh, and, Again, this isn't you can't do any of this. It's just that you have to be aware of the rules and make sure you have the proper safeguards uh, before you um, before you start the research activity. And here's the CUNY Export Control website. The has a link to CUNY College Export Control Administrators. I mentioned Angela. And then the Information Security website has just some a lot of very good uh, general guidelines for how to have research security, not just to protect from unintentional sharing with international, but any unintentional sharing. And 
non-compliance with requirements can be required retraining, loss of export privileges, loss of research funding, notification to supervisors, federal regulators, and our granting agencies, fines and criminal prosecutions. Um, you may have um, seen the uh, picture, it was I think five or six years ago now, but the Harvard chemistry professor being led away in handcuffs um, and disciplinary action by CUNY. So again, uh, these um, are all things to avoid. So um, we're about to get move on to learning objective number three. Um, Adrian, are there some questions or we should address? Um, there are a couple of questions that I'm glad to say Kristen and David answered um, because they had some nuance to them. Perhaps we'll get to them at the end, but none that specifically refer to what you've just um, just mentioned. So okay. let's move on and let's see if we can at the end. So these are solutions. So I've been uh, talking about the problems and I'm talking about how you should avoid the problems. Now we're going to be talking about how to avoid the problems. And the three that we're talking about is a mentorship relationship, good data handling and documentation, and then effective collaboration. Um, research, some research still is pretty solitary, but a lot of research involves a whole bunch of other people at other college, CUNY colleges, outside of CUNY colleges, and really your whole research community. So how does or should the mentor-mentee relationship promote responsible conduct of research? And you can answer either the how it does or how it should. Avoid conflict of interest, giving students credit for their ideas, always having number nine, ideally models the procedure, learning from expertise, guidance and transmission of existing rules, help sharing best practices, accountability, open communication, checks and balances, serving as a role model. Um, guidance. So again, it sort of kind of comes back to what Paul Krugman said, that it's the social relationships that help us all um, abide by the rules. Right. So these are the expectations that you should have for your mentor, teach you how to be capable, creative, and responsible as a researcher. Your mentor should be an advocate for you and it help you learn crucial skills, not just about the research content itself, but presenting and publishing, applying for grants, applying for jobs, and supervising and mentoring others. These are some of the expectations that you should have for your mentor. Mentors should avoid neglecting you, having unrealistic expectations, certainly should avoid undermining you, and certainly should not ignore boundaries of the professional relationship between the student and the uh, uh, the mentor and the mentee. What is it that you should do? So you should be clear or ask for help clarifying your career goals um, so that the, you know, the easiest thing is to say, I want to have a career just like yours, that might not be the case. And the more your mentor knows about that, the more they can help you. Meet agreed upon milestones or communicate why you can't. So um, do you, you don't want to ghost them. Uh, they don't want to ghost you. Uh, they're really um, maintaining communication is the key. What should you avoid? Hiding. Uh, hiding physically or hiding your problems, saying everything is okay when it isn't. Being too dependent or being too independent. And this is something that is a tightrope that graduate students and postdocs and really anybody who has a supervisor has to walk this tightrope. 
uh, you know, feel feel your way through. Um, and especially since the goal of graduate school is to make you into an independent researcher, it's a it's important to sort of keep um, just keep this in mind. Am I being too independent? Am I being too dependent in the interactions? And also, of course, um, also, it you there it is a professional relationship. There's a lot of person personality in it, but it really is a professional relationship that needs to be maintained. And if there are issues, it's always best if you can attempt to resolve it directly with your mentor. That's definitely the preferred, um, or, or even prevent them. I, when I think a, a lot of the issues um, have to do perhaps with authorship and credit and talking about that um, before you uh, pick up your pencil and start doing the research. I guess that's a very old metaphor. Um, pull out your keyboard and start typing um, the, or pick up your test tube um, to the extent that you can talk about the authorship ahead of time. It's much better to have that happen rather than to have it be an issue and try to resolve it after the fact. If you don't feel comfortable with that or that's not getting you where you want, you can seek guidance from an outside individual, uh, perhaps another professor in the department, perhaps um, the department chair, and then uh, certainly there as the Graduate Center, there are a lot of resources um, you can contact. You can change mentors that as a um, cost in time um, for the most part, but better than sticking with something that's really not working. And then um, you always have the option of filing a formal complaint. Um, better to try these other methods first, um, but that always is a um, an option that's available to you. And what should you expect from your mentor? Respect, support, availability, and integrity. That uh, they should be, as uh, people mentioned in the chat, they should be modeling the research integrity. And then what should your mentor expect from you? Same list, that you respect their time, their expertise, you um, support them, they're investing in you, um, partly because you are contributing to a, their um, research success, uh, that you're available or tell them when you're not available. And they have to be confident that you are acting with integrity. They have to be able to trust that you, everything that you tell them is uh, honest and true. So um, I guess we can, doesn't look like there are any new questions. Um I would like to see if any of those in our panel, though, Kristen, David, Diane, and Rose, have a response to this. This is one of the most critical things, of course, in the progress of a student toward degree, the relationship with their mentor. Their, um, and it must be one of trust. So do any of the three of you have more to say on this subject? Four of you? I guess one thing I would say is um, there's obviously your formal mentor or your advisor, um, but really consider the value of having a range of relationships that fall somewhere on a mentorship spectrum, people you can talk to, learn from, uh, not only to benefit your work, but also to um you know, because the relationship with your advisor is such a pivotal one, at some time in your path here, you will have questions that you have, like, what is the right thing to do? How should I approach this? Um, and, you know, having people who you can ask questions to sort of even get a better sense of how best to manage or navigate your relationship with your mentor 
what questions are reasonable for you to ask of them or how to, you know, don't feel alone in that, right? So sort of supportive mentorship, additional supplementary mentorship relationships will also help you sort of be more successful at working with your advisor and advisor and getting the best mentorship out of them. Yeah, and also just jumping off of what David said, I think one of the most important um, sources of mentorship for graduate students who are early in their training is older graduate students um, or more seasoned graduate students. And so I know some programs actually have formal peer mentoring um, programs set up whereby people perhaps who are in the dissertation phase of their training are um, kind of taking the incoming students under their wing and helping them to navigate the process, giving them a sense of what to expect from graduate school, helping to educate them with respect to maintaining work-life balance, um, choosing your classes. Um, there's a lot of information that gets shared among graduate students in terms of the various work styles of different faculty members and where they might fit best. And so um, I think informal mentorship is, and peer mentorship sometimes can be just as important, if not more important than the formal mentorship um, that you, uh, a relationship that you have with your, uh, with your advisor. So if I could, I'd first like to introduce myself and apologize for being late to the session, but um, I'm Rose Wesson. I'm Associate Provost for Research at City College of New York, and I, I'd like to build off of both what you guys said, both of you guys said, but I would also encourage you that most times you will also have a committee. So you may, you may have people other than your advisor that are, are there for you to reach out to. So um, I would also encourage you to have a relationship, get to know your committee members, and they may also be able to provide suggestions as to your research and also some of the other questions you may have regarding your experiences at CUNY. So it's not only your advisor, and as was said earlier, your peers, but also your committee. Think about your committee too as, as people that you can reach out to. Thank you, Fanny, you wanna resume? I do. Uh, if I can just jump in and just say really quickly, I just put in, a, or I'm putting in right now a link uh, into chat uh, for um, our programming, but in, on November 9th, we're going to be doing a webinar on making the most of a dissertation progress meeting. So it's going to be touching on sort of how you um, help help your advisors sort of understand your needs best and, and to, to be in a good position to help you. Thank you. Okay. So another way to avoid um, research misconduct or conduct yourself with integrity is to be aware of data management. So why is data management so important? Ethical and reproducible data transparency and reproducibility. So you can stay organized and avoid confusion, protect participant information, help catch mistakes, protecting participants, a trackable history of the data, uh, ability to others can form your conclusions, preserving raw data, ensuring data is sound. So some very good answers here. Um, and so again, this, um, seems pretty elementary, but you want to use appropriate and documented methods, attain appropriate authorizations for the uh, collecting or um, reusing data. There is something called Alcoa Plus. It's not the aluminum company, but the data should be attributable, legible, um, if you're handwriting, contemporaneous, meaning done at the same time of the observation, original, accurate, complete, consistent, and available. Um, and I'm sure that if you um, put some auditors in a room, they could come up with several more things that started with the A, L, C, O, or A. But um, this is the general idea that the, the when you're collecting data, um, it, you, it, 
that's the, you know, that's a bedrock of your research. And you need to make sure that you're, you're collecting the data with these standards in mind. Now I have data protection. And the you want to prevent auth unauthorized access. And we're sitting here in this webinar, and people are trying to hack into the CUNY colleges. It's just a fact. They're trying to hack in everywhere. And so our IT does a bang up job of preventing it, but it's an arms race. And the hackers are getting better as our protections are getting better. So if you have policies on the CUNY website, probably one of the things, some, some of the stuff like using CUNY computers and uh, which automatically have encryption um, and you know, using encrypted devices, that's pretty straightforward. The hardest part is to be aware of phishing. And the I've noticed that the phishing attempts that I get, it used to be you could just tell that it was not written by someone who was fluent in English, and now it is. So you just have to be pretty aware that people are trying to hack in and trying to get unauthorized access. And then also you control authorized access. Um, many people mention protecting participant information. If you said in the consent form that only members of the research team will have access, then you have to set up a system where you know that the only people who have access are members of the research team. And you've got to control whether it's um, in on a cloud-based system or in a, um, draw, a shared drive, and then um, respecting the ownership of data. That if um, it does sound like some people are pretty aware of that in terms of the copyrights, but just always something to keep in mind that you would not, um, you're not gonna let your, the data that you own uh, be used in a way that you're not um, isn't authorized, and you wouldn't use it, have unauthorized access to someone else's data. So then we're going to move to a collaboration. So what are the challenges and opportunities when you work with other researchers? Communication, ownership and authorship, it can help your own research. Authorship again, they open up your mind, the accountability and timing, compromise communication and credit, I like it, broaden horizons, coordinating data formats, various perspective, differing opinions, different methods of research, cooperation efficiency, learn new skills, these are all excellent. So what you want to make sure when you collaborate is either formally in writing or informally define the roles of everybody in the project, the scope of the project for each person, the goals, ownership, credit, and authorship. So these should be clear. Um, it's very uncomfortable when you assume something and then you find out from your collaborator, oh no, you know, I'm I'm not going to put your name on the paper because whatever. So uh, it's just like having the authorship discussion with your advisor ahead of time. It's a little uncomfortable, but if you can do it, it can prevent a lot of misunderstandings and hurt feelings later on. Um, if it's a non-CUNY collaborator, there uh, really should be a written plan that includes the responsibilities for compliance with each institution's um, requirements. That who who is um, you know, a typical example is um, if there's expenditures and there's a sub award, you know who's going to be doing the reporting on that, um, and intellectual property and data ownership. That um, it's just again it's like a prenuptial agreement um you can take it to say oh well maybe we shouldn't get married if you don't trust me but uh, it's better in the long run to have done this and um there are certainly some things where um 
it's actually required that you can't do it. So a data use agreement, a data transfer agreement, materials, if there's specimens or other things that are being transferred, if it's sponsored research, if there's a subaward, IRB authorization agreements, independent research agreements, collaborative research agreements, and confidentiality agreements. And um, all of these are written agreements the different people at different colleges um, have responsibilities for different types. It's just very important to be aware that um, you are going to be needing these and, um, and you can't sign them yourself. And the easiest reason to convince you that you shouldn't sign them yourself is if there's a violation, CUNY signed it, it's CUNY's legal office who will defend you. If you signed it yourself, um, you'd have to pay for a lawyer. And CUNY would probably discipline you for doing that. So these, you know, you don't own your research results you're doing that you're doing on behalf of CUNY. CUNY does. They obviously want you to do them and not let, let you use the data. But for things like when you're going to be transferring data in and out, it does have to be an agreement between CUNY and the other institution. And then a uh, final example of collaboration is peer review. And um, I don't know if any of you have been a peer reviewer yet, but you will be a peer review. And um, you, so you can look at this as a peer reviewer and you should look at this as what you can expect from the peer reviews that you get. And it's both for publications and grant applications. And actually, in some cases, um, there might be in a big meeting, there might be a peer review for posters and presentations as well. Being a peer reviewer is time consuming and typically unpaid um, to do grant applications. You, I think, get a small stipend from the granting agencies, but typically for journals, it's unpaid. The third point, criticism should be constructive. You don't want to have, um, say, this paper contains much that is new and much that is interesting, but what is new is not interesting and what is interesting is not new. That's not a real helpful constructive criticism on a paper. Um, certainly, it should go without saying, but may not confidentiality and originality should be protected. One of the reasons that people continue to agree to be peer reviewers is that it's kind of exciting and interesting to see what other people in your field are doing, but you have to respect their original ideas and um, not, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a privileged a access to those ideas. And then, of course, um, if there's a conflict of interest, uh, you should recuse yourself um, or, I guess, in some cases, figure out if it can be managed. But And um, contrary-wise, if you feel like um, if, it's, if it's not a anonymous reviewer and you feel that the reviewer has a conflict of interest and um, is being too hard on you because of that, then you could appeal to the editor or the granting agency. Okay, so um, this is talking about the your interactions with the research community. Um, and then the final slides are know where to get help. And we're gonna start with a couple scenarios where you might need help. So this is the first one. Um, what could you do if your faculty advisor puts pressure on you to get good results fast? Work fast, okay. It doesn't guarantee the good results. Be transparent about challenging the timing. Exp Explaining that rushing would sacrifice the integrity, speak to other members, communicate, put in extra time, talk to your advisor, your committee, your chair, work really hard, cut other things, tell them to chill. Um, that could work. Um, get support from other community members, meet with them to talk about, uh, develop a work plan. 
plan clearly describing the limitations, working too fast might um, result in mistakes, say no. I think we have some pretty bold people here. I think it, we should all emulate them um, if rather than just working hard and cutting out everything else, re-examining boundaries and expectations, be honest. So th there's not a slide with the answers. So I'm going to stay just a few moments more on this and then come up with another scenario. Definitely say no. Explain that getting good results is never a surefire thing and trying to do it fast will diminish chances of that outcome. Explain the difficulty. So I think um, what I like is that these answers are all sort of um, riffing on the concept of communication. And again, um, if, the, you know, this is sort of, how you stay on the right path. And if you say no, and then that doesn't work, then um, some of the other panelists on the previous discussion were talking about some of the resources you might have. Um, what could you do if you're not sure about the right way to collect and analyze your data? Ask, 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 okay. Um, you know, the some people ask, 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 talk to other graduates, ask for guidance. Sometimes, you know, you've all been extremely successful in college and you've gotten to graduate school and there's an expectation that you know a lot. And so it can be difficult sometimes. Um, I'm glad to see all of these asks. I hope that because that is the right thing to do, that to go ahead and say, well, I think this is how other people do it. Let me just go ahead and not make a fool of myself. Um, you could be right um, or you could not be right. And um, the consequences of not being right that you knew what you were doing are worse than um, potentially showing to your faculty advisor that you don't know everything. You're only supposed to know everything once you've got your PhD. Okay, great. Look at the literature, talk to other professors who specialize in SAT methods as well. So yes, trying to do some of your homework first, um, that's not at all a bad idea, but certainly ask. What could you do if a collaborator is making you uneasy? Communicate with the supervisor, talk to your committee, talk to your mentor, seek a mediator, talk to your PI, tell them you feel uneasy if that does not work, okay? Communication is the key. Talk to them first and then ask for help. So um, all of these are really good answers. Um, the I don't see the answer, um, ignore it and hope it will go away because that would not really, um, that's sometimes effective. It could be sometimes that you just completely misinterpreted something and spun it into a story about how this is the end of the world and it turns out that it was a completely benign action on their part. So ignoring that would be okay, but you don't know. And so talking and communicating again, um, this, is, um, this is really is the key. And then um, this is the last one. Uh, what could you do if you felt your whole career hinged on quickly publishing in a high profile journal? Stop thinking that way. I like it. <laughs> Take a deep breath, get to work, breathe and relax, have someone look over your list, consider other careers. Good things don't come easy. Panic. Uh, first things first. Try your best, but focus on the journey, not the destination. Speak with mentors. Look for other alternatives. Revisit your expectations. Patience, patience, patience. Seek advice from mentors, peers. Understand journals are not the be all, end all. Uh, these are really um, great answers, and I um, I really like the way that everybody's sharing as a community so that um, you might think again that there is someone you can talk to to help you with um, feelings like this. And this could be 
you know, especially if the pressure might be coming from outside, that's again where you might uh, talk to your committee or to older graduate students um, for help. So part of the reason of posing these dilemmas is to show that if you feel this way, you're not alone. Um, this wasn't any particular person who told me that they felt that way, but this is um, these are some of the common things that can make you feel uncomfortable. And the reason that these are all in the research integrity training is because these are situations where you might be tempted to do something that you know isn't quite right. And not quite right is not right. It's not horseshoes. You don't get credit for being close. Um, you need to act with integrity. So um, this is the end uh, on this slide. Um, there's a link to the, again, a link to the College Research Integrity Officers. Um, these are the people in the central office and there have been uh, links throughout these slides for people. Um, and then um, this, this is just the last slide. Um, Thank you so much for, uh, I really, really appreciate the chat waterfall. It made this um, seem very interactive and everybody was giving really excellent answers. Um, so I think if there are questions, Adrian, or- uh, There are a couple that I'd like to, for us to pursue. I will tell you that seeing the great response we've had from students and some excellent questions asked that we haven't had a chance to get to, after this event, a couple of things will happen. First of all, once again, I'll repeat, if you've attended, you'll get email that will confirm your attendance and I will share that list with your APOs. Secondly, at the website, and I'll send you the link to it, at the website for research and sponsor programs and specifically responsible conduct of research, the website I maintain, you'll see the slides from this presentation, which clearly people will value. Thank you, Fanny. And we'll eventually have video with transcription of this event. And also we'll print some replies to a few of the questions that were asked that seem to have the most uh, interest in the audience, the most universal interest. Um, I'm going to actually ask one of those questions that David gave a reply to. And um, that was a student wrote, could you speak more about the conflicts in the humanities. I feel like the line between accidental plagiarism, this is going back to information from the beginning of the presentation, and influence between ideas and scholars is often murky and hard to define. David, can you give a response to that? You're you're muted. Sorry, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, Really, you know, just to reiterate what I said in, in the written comment, um, it's important to, to, you know, realize that when you're an advanced scholar, um, there's a social dimension to uh, writing and research, right? Like, you, you, it shouldn't be the case that you are thinking on your own and sort of sending it out into the world that you're getting feedback, you're having peers and colleagues look at it, um, you know, and and especially when you have someone look at it who is sort of an expert in your uh, area or an adjacent area of research, part of what you're, you know, benefiting from is a chance to see if they think, well, you know, when you talk about X, it, it really sounds like what so-and-so has been doing. Did, you know, did you read that? Have you thought about citing it? Um, and getting an opportunity to not just be the only person whose knowledge base is sort of uh, at, at your disposal, but you know to have a series of people who can point out um, that there's a, a, enough of a proximity uh, between what you're doing and what someone else has said uh, that that even if you hadn't read it and didn't know about it, you can make a citation and kind of offer some kind of commentary. Um, and this is also includes like when you submit things for peer review, this is often something that a reviewer will point out um, that there's a few citations they'd like you to add in. Um, so, you know, 
you, you're you're making a good faith effort. Do an internal audit. Like if you think that there's an idea that that you want to acknowledge, uh, you know, the the relationship you're having between what you're thinking and saying and someone else, cite cite it. Um, but the other part is to um, allow for a process where other people see your work and can tell you, you know, where they think there's something that should be acknowledged, right? And if you've done both of those things, I really don't think you should allow yourself to be too worried. Uh, there was an additional question, I think that sort of begs to be answered. Kristen, you were asked a question about, or you responded to a question about whether you feel pressured by a mentor to come up with favorable results to cherry pick from among your results. Would you like to respond briefly? Uh, well, I just, I did respond in text and noted that, um, that if certainly if someone is selectively uh, reporting and analyzing hypothesis confirming data and ignoring the rest, that that would rise to the level of falsification. But I, I think that you know, there's this other set of, just to elaborate my response, there is this other set of um, questionable research practices, which um, are often considered to be a little bit more murky or a little bit more controversial. Like for example, if you run four experimental conditions and you only report three because you identify a problem with one of your experimental conditions, is it okay to drop that from the research record? Or if you have extra dependent variables and you decide to toss some of those must those be reported and analyzed um, or um, can they simply be omitted from the research record? So I, I'm i reluctant to ever read a description of something in a couple sentences and say this is research misconduct or it isn't because a lot of times um, you need a lot more contextual detail of exactly what's happening to determine what's, um, what's going on. And of course, any allegations of research, research misconduct would undergo the, the normal due process, um, including interviews and sequestration of records and all that stuff. But in terms of what a particular person should do if they're being pressured by an advisor to do something that they perceive as being, um, you know, an act of research misconduct or um, at minimum questionable research practice is simply not, not to do it and to explain the concern and the um, resistance to um, to complying with that. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to come, to, you know, of course, we would always encourage people to report instances of perceived misconduct. Um, but if you're not comfortable doing that, certainly um, that does not mean that you should necessarily go along with it or or comply with um, with the pressure to do that. So um, my my best recommendation always is to have set up a confidential meeting with the research integrity of, integrity officer at your institution um, to try to figure out what the best approach forward would be. And even if um, it doesn't lead to um, an inquiry and a subsequent investigation. You might benefit from simply having the conversation about how best to handle that situation. Mm -hmm. We expect all of those in the audience to uh, practice and model good um, research practices. And uh, I hope that today's presentation has helped you understand that they are known and you can find those who can guide you um, into this right path. Um, if there are comments from our other two panelists, Rose or Diane, anything further to add? No, um, specific to the question that, that Kristen was answering, I think um, you know the idea is to talk to somebody about this and, and the research integrity officer is a good person to start with and have that conversation. So again, if you feel as if your advisor or you feel uncertain about some of the things that your advisor may be asking of you, requesting of you, then yes, it is good to talk to someone about it and and you know and and just get another perspective. If no one has further comments, I want to thank Fanny for her presentation and all of you for your comments. And to the audience, thank you very much for your excellent chat and questions. And you can continue to submit those to us and we'll answer them, okay? Thanks, and we'll conclude this session. Thank you, bye now. <laughs>